thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining. So I am Philip Wiley. I have my CISSP, OSCP, and, and SANS GW APT certs. My current role is offensive security expert at Horizon 3.ai. We have an autonomous pen testing platform. I'm an offensive security professional and evangelist. So even outside of my day job, since we have offensive security tool, I'm always evangelizing the need for offensive security. I think it's one area that's often un un overlooked, uh, underestimated, and misunderstood because you can do all the compliance you want. You can be PCI compliant, but that doesn't mean your company can't be breached. Some companies are too caught up on the compliance. While compliance is important, you need to make sure that you're doing your due diligence on everything, proper pen testing and everything to make sure that what you're doing is working. So I'm a former adjunct instructor. So I used to teach at Dallas College. So that was kind of a turning point for me in my career. I've always been kind of a competitive person. I used to be a power lifter. Uh, when I worked in sales, I was always trying to be the top salesperson. So I always worked hard at what I was doing. Not to say I was ever the best hacker or pen tester, but always really put so much effort in that. But in 2018, I became more outwardly focused. Uh, I kind of looked at my wife, what she was doing. She taught an ESL program. She had a lot of students that were uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, and they would come to her for help and where they needed to help and just see that legacy that she built. and how she was helping those people and I wanted to do the same thing. So I started teaching at Dallas College, got into a lot more mentoring and speaking. So my book, The Pen Tester Blueprint, came out of my lecture at Dallas College on becoming a pen tester, which turned into a conference talk at B-Size DFW in, in 2018. And kind of an interesting fact, when I gave that talk, some of the people that was in the audience, you may have heard of uh, Juno, she's part of the Cult of the Dead Cow. She was one of my students, but at the time of that presentation, she was just kind of in the audience. I knew her from the community. She watched the talk, uh, enrolled in my pen testing class the, the next semester, and then went on to be a, a, a really good pen tester and all around awesome cybersecurity professional. And so last year during Bishop Fox DEF CON live stream, I had the honor of being interviewed by her on that live stream. So really cool to see uh, former students and mentees get out there and doing stuff. So let's. A lot of where my focus is at, why I got into the conference speaking and stuff, why I wrote the book. The book was a way to provide that information to people that aren't going to the conferences because every conference I went to that I gave the pen tester blueprint talk, a majority of the audience hadn't heard it yet. So give these talks so many times over when people review uh, conference talks, they think, well, we can't take talks that's been given somewhere else, somewhere else. But you just don't know how many times those talks haven't been, been uh, heard. And so that's one of the reasons writing the book was a way to get that information out there to people that I would probably never run into at a conference or anywhere else. So uh, that's been one of my proudest achievements and a way to serve the community and serve those I hadn't got to meet yet. So I'm also was featured in a Tribe of Hackers Red Team book. That's kind of how I got the, the book deal. They asked me if I had any ideas for a book and I wanted to turn that into a book. I'm also the host of the, the Hacker Factory, previous host of the Hacker Factory podcast, which uh, I went independent last April, April of last year. And I, the new show is the Philip Wiley show, same format, video now and just not audio only. Uh, at the recommendation of some friends, I went independent. And so this is one story that I like to share with everyone trying to break into cybersecurity because whenever, whenever I graduated high school a long time ago, I graduated like back in 1984. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't take high school seriously. And my my grade point average wasn't high enough for my college entrance exam score. So I was gonna have to get like eight recommendation letters from teachers. And so I really decided my heart really wasn't into it. I didn't know what I wanted to do anyway. So some of my friends said, you know, you're a power lifter, you're a big guy, you should be a pro wrestler. So I thought that sounds fun. So I went off and went to wrestling school and, and wrestled professionally for a couple years. And during that time, I wrestled people like Mick Foley, uh, went to wrestling school at The Undertaker, uh, wrestled uh, the free, two of the three Freebirds, Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts. Uh, wrestled a couple of Dwayne Johnson's relatives that wrestled as the Samoan SWAT team. So it was an interesting experience, but when I got married, I needed a job with insurance and benefits. And pro wrestling didn't have any benefits at that time. Uh, I was making like maybe, when I first started wrestling, I got $75 a night. And by the time uh, I quit wrestling, they were paying $25 per match which you'd only get to wrestle typically one time. They didn't have insurance, so if you got injured, 
you just kind of had to take care of this out of your own pocket. So I was trying to figure out what to do. So I worked all sorts of manual labor jobs and I'm the kind of person that I have to be doing something I'm interested in or it's just hard, hard to do. Out of all the jobs I did, I did manual labor, retail sales, worked as a cook, busting tables, washing dishes, putting up fences, roofing houses, uh, doing construction, didn't like any of that stuff. Uh, but the one job I did like was jewelry sales. I was working at a jewelry store. I was always number one or number two in selling jewelry in the store. And the family that owned that, that jewelry store, they were starting a new chain. They were uh, Lebanese and they thought if we created a store chain with an American sounding name, we could be, you know, compete with Zales and stuff like that. So their intent was to bring me in and make me an assistant manager. And so the store manager had different ideas. There was the, the person that was always either beating me or getting beat by me in sales was a qualified candidate and he was really wanting to put her in as a system manager. I totally understood that, but one of the things I did realize too is I needed to get some skills where I can make a good living and it's not dependent on someone's political or just someone's opinion, just you know, right or wrong. You, know, you, you work in some of those type of jobs, you're only gonna get ahead as much as the people helping you. Even back to pro wrestling, it was kind of dependent on whether people wanted to do something with you to promote you because when I wrestled, I had to lose all the time. And they, that's referred to as a jobber or a job boy. So you're paid to go and lose to make the good guys look good. And so one of the things there is if they like you or if you're a relative of someone in that, you get to move up quicker. And there was someone there that was booking the matches. When I was there that year in the WCCW, which is in Dallas, Fort Worth, where the Von Erichs wrestled, if anyone's seen the Iron Claw movie, it was that wrestling territory. They, uh, one of the, bookers there wanted to send me to Kansas City and that was one of the spots where the people got practice you know got the experience and come back and got to be a legitimate wrestler and not lose all the time but by the time uh, they got around to planning that he had the, the Federation had been sold off someone else come in so I lost that that connection so one of the things I looked at based on that experience working the jewelry store I needed to get a trade where I can make good money in advance regardless of whether I was a manager or whether you know depending on what someone's preference wouldn't hold me back in my career. So one day I was watching television and saw this uh, commercial for the American Trades Institute is a trade school in uh, Hearst, Texas, and I always liked drawing in high school and took some drafting classes. So I decided to, to attend that school. So I learned AutoCAD. So this was back in, by the time I got out was about 94. I was like one of the, another one of the points I like to share here to encourage people. When I was going through this CAD school, I had a computer at home. My ex-wife's dad had gave us a computer and basically all we were doing is back then you had Prodigy was one of the internet services or whatever and it was really limited what you could do. You could play online games. I could boot a computer, play those online games and that was it. Once I went to CAD school, I was probably the worst computer skills wise. And by the time I got finished with school and was in the workplace, I was finding different uh, features on new versions of AutoCAD quicker than my coworkers were. And when Windows 95 came out, I figured out how to use that. I was figuring out how to be able to network systems, how to print, do network printing when our local IT guy, which uh, I worked for this this uh, manufacturing company, their main headquarters was in Stephenville, Texas. That's where all the IT staff was at, but they had one accounting person that did our IT in our office. He wasn't able to figure out how to get Windows to print, uh, Windows 95 to print on a Novell network and I was able to figure it out. And this is the first time I ever got called a hacker. So before I ever thought about being one, this guy was kind of uh, jealous because I was able to figure out something he wasn't. He was kind of the, the on-site uh, IT staff. But what I've learned is I had a lot more better, uh, more of a knack and just kind of reiterating on that story. I went in not thinking I had the skills and I learned it. So if you're just starting out in your career, maybe you've been in security, you're just getting into pen testing. The more you do these things, the better you're gonna get. So kind of give yourself some grace and realize that you don't start out as this awesome hacker, or pen tester, or whatever security prof professional. It takes time and you can get there. And if you're ambitious and putting the time, you can get there sooner. So I found out about sysadmin work. I was being, uh, this company I was working at, we were being billed out at $30 an hour. We were making half of that. They brought in a consultant to work on our server and they were billing out $50 an hour. So I thought, well, he's making about $25 an hour. That's $10 an hour more than what I'm making. And what they're doing looks a lot more interesting so I taught myself how to build computers, took a Novell Network, network Operating System uh, course. For those of you that are not familiar with that, Novell Network was the predominant network, network operating system before Microsoft came out with Active Directory. 
So got my first sysadmin job, did that for six years and wanted to get an information security, got some uh, the CISSP and the, the NSA IAM certification and got to move over in the security team in 2004. So we got a new CISO at the company about 2005, around September 2005. He had a more modern idea of the way security organizations should be uh, divided. So for, for us, it was everyone was doing network security, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, some vulnerability scanning. But when he came in, he put me on the application security team and that's where I found out about pen testing. I was managing our third party pen test and got to do some vulnerability scanning. So when I got laid off in 2012, I applied for a consulting role with Verizon and got my first pen testing job. And another lesson there is to just, if you wanna do it, apply for it. Don't, you know, let them turn you down. Don't be the thing that's gonna prevent you from getting the roles. I, they took a chance on me and one of the things they saw was my passion to learn. I was doing a lot of self-study. Uh, I was doing, I used to do web design on the side and I hosted the web servers in my home. So this manager saw that I like to build things and do a lot of self-learning. So he liked that. That was his kind of, his way of doing things. He really wasn't big on telling us, go take this pen testing course. He said, learn how to build it first. Then if you know how to build it, you can secure it and then it's gonna be easier to break into it. So I kind of fit the culture and his mindset and they gave me the job. They took a chance on me because my background, I had some vulnerability scanning, application security, network security, and also sysadmin. The sysadmin experience gave me more towards that job than anything else. So uh, first five years of my career I spent consulting, worked internally for companies. And so consulting, if you had a chance to do consulting, I highly recommend that experience because you get access to so many different environments. If you work in environments, they're gonna change systems, things are gonna change, but on a slower pace compared to consulting. In consulting, you're uh, exposed to so many different types of systems and you've got less time to test uh, because actually if you're going from an internal employee to a consultant, it gets a little more difficult because at US Bank, I came from, from AT&T having a week to do the same pen test we had four weeks to do there. And so if you're doing things right, you're gonna be able to test more thoroughly. But if you go from that to testing as a consultant, you've got a lot less time. You have to learn to be able to do more in less time. So the, the uh, consulting experience is very important. So what is pen testing? So before we get into how to get the experience, we're just gonna cover it. So it's testing uh, different digital assets and targets from a threat actor perspective, because people are always worried about getting hacked, malicious hackers, they're always, what are we trying to protect our systems from, threat actors. So you have to learn how to think like they do. And, and one of the advantages that has is if you're able to find, you're able to assess the security from a threat actor's perspective, you're able to find vulnerabilities that are actually needing to be remediated. You run a Nessa scan, Nexpo scan or Tenable, you find these vulnerabilities that they say may be exploitable, but not necessarily so. Sometimes they've got mitigating controls in place. Sometimes if you get a foothold, there's other things you can do, get access to. So a pen test is really required. And so some of the experience you need to get at first is learning how to use the tools. And one of the things I'd recommend you know, if you look at the OSCP course, and there's a lot of good courses out there, most of the stuff they're telling you to do is manually. Uh, they're like with uh, OSCP, they don't allow use of vulnerability scanners, which is building some good manual skills. But one of the things it doesn't do is show aspiring security professionals or those trying to break into pen testing, how a real pen test is done. So when you're doing a real pen test, you don't have all the time to manually test everything. You'll run your vulnerability scanners, and then you'll go through and do some manual testing the vulnerability scanning kind of helps guide you. So a good way to get that experience, I believe TryHackMe has a, a Nessus track on their vulnerability management track that you could go in there and learn how to use uh, Nessus. So you can download a, a free version of Nessus that'll test 16 IP addresses. And so in your home lab environment, you're able to use that. So you get experience with a vulnerability scanner, that's a transferable skill to work in a company in vulnerability management. Because when I worked at US Bank, there were people coming in from the vulnerability management team or the remediation team moving over because the vulnerability management was basically just working with uh, remediation, running the reoccurring vulnerability scans. The remediation team would go through and test to see if it was still vulnerable from the pen test. So those were skills that prepared them to move into pen testing. So learning how to use a vulnerability scanner can be important. Uh, it's, you know, the, learning how to do the manual stuff is important as well. So you have your network vulnerability scanners as I have listed up here, Nessus, Nexpos, OpenVos, and Nuclei. OpenVos also has a free version uh, that you can download, but I would recommend 
Nessus since it's pretty well, probably most widely used in consulting, but used a lot in internal organizations. So some companies use the commercial version, which is Tenable Essentials or, ten, uh, or Tenable, and it's the same type product, but getting used that's helpful. Learning how to use uh, Linux, especially the different operating systems that are geared towards pen testing, like Kali Linux and Parrot OS, those are two, two of the best. I, uh, there's some others out there, like Arch and some other uh, pen testing distros, but the nice thing about Kali Linux and Parrot OS, they've been maintained for a long time and work really well. And another thing too is learn how to use tools in a Windows environment. So Mandiant came out with a couple different uh, VMs or projects, one's Commando VM and one's Flare VM. Commando is strictly pen testing tools, whereas Flare VM is reverse engineering. So reverse engineering is important to pen testers. So you take your Windows VM or your bare metal operating system and you run these scripts against it. It's a, it'll take a long time. It takes like hours to run these scripts. It uses, uh, the automation it uses, the scripts are called chocolatey as the scripts it uses but it's kind of comparable to some of these other automation tools for Windows, but it installs all those tools. And one of the things it does for you that's kind of a, a, a pain when you're setting up a Windows system to do hacking is it goes in and sets like a shared section of your drive where, you know, Windows Defender or antivirus is not going to delete your tools. Because if you ever try to install tools on Windows, Windows Defender, you know, is doing its job, what it should be doing, what looks like malware, removing it. So trying to set up a pen testing box is kind of difficult. So one of the best options with this, not only does it install tools, it prepares your hard drive so your tools aren't gonna to be deleted. So other pen testing tools like Nmap and Metasploit. Uh, Metasploit's a good one, it's a, a exploit framework and one of the only free ones out there, just about everything else is paid. And you get a lot of this similar functionality out of Metasploit Community Edition compared to Professional, because Professional kind of integrates with their Nexpose product. So if you're lucky enough to work for one of these companies as Nexpose, you're able to find some of these vulnerabilities and it works kind of uh, integratedly with, with Metasploit. But fortunately, I'm glad I started out with the Community Edition because it's a little more difficult. So if you don't have the opportunity to use Metasploit Pro. And so different web application pen testing tools, Burp Suite is like one of the industry standards. Zap is good and does a lot of things. But one of the things with Burp Suite, most companies that are looking for pen testers typically want you to have uh, Burp Suite experience and uh, different web application vulnerability scanners. So Burp Suite Pro does vulnerability scanning and OWASP Zap or Zap actually, they, they're they part of another project now, they're outside of OWASP, uh, but it does vulnerability scanning as well. So if you're using uh, Burp Suite community, then you can use the vulnerability scanning feature of, of Zap. And so, Fuzzers are also good options to learn how to use these tools. So getting to learn how these tools is important, getting the hands-on experience. So as you learn how to use these tools, uh, some other skills that are helpful, and this is all kind of depends on where you are in your career. So if you, you're working in IT, you may have the networking and, and operating system skills, but you kind of need the operating system skills at a sysadmin level. I had students before and a lot of and mentees coming in. So you, you spent like six years as a sysadmin, do I have to work in IT? You don't have to work in a specific roles. You just kind of need the sysadmin level experience. And when you talk to some experienced people in the industry, you'll run into gatekeepers, but then you run into people that's just their honest opinion that they think you have to work in IT first. But I recommend having those skills because, you know, if you're wanting to be a pen tester, you don't want to wait six or 10 years to get into that, into that type of job. So also hacking and pen testing, this is an important part. Whenever I started my job at Verizon, I knew how to run vulnerability scanners. I didn't know how to to hack, so I had to gain the hacking skills. So the OSCP was the best option at the time, so I signed up for the OSCP. Also took some of the e-learn security courses. And then reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is important because maybe you're doing a pen test and you find an APK file for an Android app. Sometimes there's hard-coded credentials in those APK files and even Java JAR files. Uh, I did a pen test once for an airline and we found a Java JAR file that was used for their application and it had hard-coded credentials to the database in there. So it has the username for the bad database, you log into the application, but it connected to the database using the same credentials. But from reverse engineering, that was able to uncover it. So that's an important uh, skill to learn there as well. So getting the hands-on experience, this is what's gonna be very valuable. Sometimes you think that if you don't have the professional experience, if you learn how to do this through CTFs, hack the box, try hack me, uh, Offensive Security has their cyber range with vulnerable VMs, building your own home lab. Getting this experience and, and documented is a way to get that experience. Because 
if you're going through a job interview and you don't have the actual professional experience, if you're able to explain how the tools work, that's going to be helpful because as a pen tester, in your experience, you're going to get asked these same questions. How do I do this type of testing with Burp Suite? Or, you know, how do you use Nessus or these other vulnerability scanners? And how do you use Metasploit? You'll get asked some of these questions. So if you can answer those questions, that'll go a long way for helping you get through the interview. So other ways to get experience is through bug bounties. So bug bounties are kind of like crowdsourced pen testing. But with bug bounties, uh, it's basically you're getting paid per bug. And some people get into it and they find duplicates or the the duplicate, the finding they find is a downgrade, they don't get paid for it. But don't get discouraged. The thing is, you're finding these vulnerabilities. And if you're able to find those, if you're doing a pen test, you would be able to find these vulnerabilities. And one of the reasons I think people should look at bug bounty learning resources and even try bug bounty, as a pen tester, you get paid to do the job, period. But with bug bounty hunters, you have to work really hard to find bugs. And some of those people are able to find bugs that maybe a pen tester may miss because they're having to do different tricks to try to find those bug bounties because they want to get paid. So using that will ma make you a better web app pen tester. And so there's also pen test as a service. So Cobalt does this, Synac. But with Cobalt, they do like network pen testing, web application pen testing. Cobalt's nice too because they pay $1,500 per pen test. So by pen testing for, uh, terms and compared to other roles, that's not a lot of money, but it's good side money. And once you've done that for a year, you've got a year's worth of pen testing experience. Now you've got that experience that you can apply somewhere full time and make more money. So I'm hearing of people making $60, uh, $80 an hour, 10.99 contract doing pen testing. A company I work for, they were paying like $113 an hour. So once you get that experience, then you're able to translate that over to full-time jobs and you know, people are starting to see because one of the things i i talked to someone when i was interviewing for a job back in 2020 and they said it's easier to find web app pen testers because bug bounty because this gives people an opportunity you're able to do real world pen testing whereas there's not really much out there for the infrastructure side testing you know servers and hosts outside of pen test as a service and some of these offer like a if you look at synac red team and Cobalt, they have different paths to apply for their team. And some of us going through some of the hack the box uh, challenges. You have certain certifications, it'll get you a, an interview. So there's different things in the career path to help you get in there. So the more of this experience you get that uh, you're able to get in the roles like that, that'll, that'll help you get your foot in the store, in the door. So pro bono and low cost pen testing. So if you know some nonprofit or religious groups that they can't afford pen tests, you can offer to do a pen test for them. And if you know someone has a small business you could charge them a really low price. And so you're actually getting professional experience and you're kind of starting a side consulting company. Uh, but this is a way to help someone else and get experience at the same time. Plus then you can get referrals from these people as well and get referred to, to a potential other business. And CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures. This is one that, uh, that I was aware of, but something I never did. But one of the things I would say for, and I've talked to other people that work in pen testing and they say hiring, uh, professionals, if they find someone that has a CVE, sometimes they value that over a certification because with a CVE, you're finding a vulnerability that may have not existed before, essentially a zero day. And so they know you're going to be able to find vulnerabilities past what a vulnerability scanner will do. So I'm sure most of you are, are uh, familiar with CVEs is basically a database of these vulnerabilities that you report to. Some companies maintain their own. MITRE and some other organizations uh, maintain these databases. But one of the nice things about this, you get a CVE, you can put it on your resume. On LinkedIn, you can put it on publications. So you can put a description of that CVE on there and put a link to it. So that way people can validate. They can go to the CVE and say your name, see your name on there and see that you actually uh, found that CVE. So that goes a long way. So someone sees you're finding CVEs, then you're more than well qualified to be a pen tester. So some good le learning resources on that. I recommend it. And so uh, Joe Helly was the one who really brought my attention to, to doing this. Uh, he's also known as the mayor. He works for TCM. But what he did is he found some open source software, web application software. He built a web server at home, set up a server, installed the, the software, and performed a pen test against it. What bugs he found, he reported those CVEs and got credit for it. And then he's built up CVEs. You see some of the really good bug bounty hunters. They've got lots of CVEs, so this is a good way to build up your resume, improve experience before you're actually getting paid as a pen tester. So Bobby Cook had some really good information and Joe Helley referred that. So when he was going through one of the offensive security, the OSWE certification, 
he was working on finding O days and stuff to help him through that certification process. So both of these these articles are really good. And if you go to Joe Helly's uh, Medium, he's got several different write ups that he's done on finding CVEs. So demonstrating skills. So you're taking these different recommendations that I mentioned. Uh, and so you do write ups on it. So if you're doing a CTF, hack the box or try hack me, of course, be sure to respect if they say not to share this on the internet or something. So that way you don't get any kind of trouble with them, but uh, do write ups. You can do that medium GitHub or through blogs. Uh, if you like to do video type stuff, record walkthroughs on YouTube. There's been a lot of security professionals that really launched their career through content creation. It's a really good way to build your brand. As I mentioned, CVE IDs earlier, you document that on your resume and on LinkedIn. And then scripts or programs you write, even if you alter a script to do something else, share that on your GitHub. People like to see what you're doing and uh, you may be competing against someone for the same pen test job. You could have the identical certs, but the CVEs may be the thing or the things you got documented may be the thing that helps you get the job. And this kind of demonstrates some of your skills, some of the things that through the first interview they may not get and through one that you may not see something until a technical interview, but you're able to prove that. And these stacks of resumes that they're getting in, it's kind of a good way to, to help you know, kind of get you that uh, that interview. And one of the things too is, you know, used to is just artists that needed to have portfolios, but security professionals, especially when you're just starting out and new to the industry, it's a good idea to, to you know, kind of have a portfolio of the things you've done. Document your uh, journey, just like the cyber mentor started out creating videos because he is documenting his learning experience. So you can do the same thing. And I've seen a lot of people do well with that and kind of the more connections you build on social media, the easier it is to get jobs. And an example I like to share is I was uh, looking for a job last October. I gave my two weeks notice. I really didn't start looking until a week or so before that two weeks notice. Uh, I left on a Thursday by Friday. I had two job offers the next day. And part of that was because my network, I'm connected with my network. They know what I do. And so it was, I had a lot of different uh, people reached out to me with jobs to, to interview for. And so the more you're connected, and one of the things you're going to do too is kind of get past that HR firewall. Now they're using AI and these systems, you upload your, your application. And one of the things I tell you there is if you can network with people, you can get your resume in the hands of a hiring manager easier. Companies are paying referral bonuses and a lot of people in your LinkedIn network may be happy to get, you know, $500 up to $3,000 bonus to refer you because otherwise when they're going to recruiters, that could be 10, 20,000, could be 10% or 20% of your first year salary that they pay these recruiters. And so referrals, people are happy to refer you a lot of times. So that's kind of a good way to, to do that. And kind of to go on into this a little further, this is kind of building your personal brand. Uh, share what you're comfortable with. There's some security professionals that don't like to be very public, but it's easy to build your brand and keep your private life out of it. But using some of these ways I mentioned to document your experience, so streaming, uh, creating videos and writing, these are good ways to get uh, your name out there. Writing is pretty important. So find one of these mediums that, if you're too shy to be on camera, but the funny thing is, it's interesting the way that works too. Some people that are comfortable speaking in person have a hard time recording solo. That's funny with me because I can do in-person speaking and I do well, but if I'm trying to record at home by myself, it's the hardest thing in the world. I did a video one time for CompTIA and I took like 20 or 30 takes to kind of get that video acceptable. But then you take some people that are super introverted, they can go home, turn on a camera, record this stuff. It doesn't phase them, but they don't speak in public very well. So find what you're comfortable with. And sometimes it may be writing and all this is important. So speaking of conferences, security meetings, we had a recent, uh, UT, UT Arlington uh, student at one of the DEF CON 214 meetings and one of the hiring managers from City was there. They did a talk on malware analysis. This hiring manager worked at incident response team, asked for the resume, they got a job. So they basically displayed their technical skills through this meetup doing this talk. Goes back to this could have been a recorded video or other things, but this was a way to kind of almost do a technical interview and prove uh, their skills. And this makes it a lot easier on the hiring managers because they get so many resumes in that they got to find ways to, to, to get rid of resumes. And it could be, they're looking through to see how certifications, maybe they don't look at them deeply enough and you get missed over, but doing stuff like this and working on your network is a good way to build that. And one of the things I'd, I'd say too, because plays back into the professional networking, uh, cause for me back in 2017, I wanted to get out of consulting. I was tired of the travel. 
uh, I met someone at OWASP meeting. They told me they're hiring at US Bank. I gave them a resume. I had an interview within a week, had an offer within two weeks. At the same time, I applied for a job at Bank of America, was more than qualified, had my OSCP, SANS Web App Pen Testing Certification, CISSP, and I didn't hear back from them for from a year later. And I just went on their, their application system, uploaded my resume, and applied, and didn't get the job so you can realize someone is trying to break in, it can be even more difficult. These systems are looking for different keywords that maybe you're not using enough, maybe they're not using the correct industry standard way of speaking and, and sharing things. And I've seen companies where actually one company I worked at before, we we're having a hard time finding red teamers out of India, but the original job description was geared more towards uh, web app pen testing. So I had a bunch of bug bounty hunters. So we changed the, the job description to include like active directory and infrastructure pen testing. We started getting good qualified resumes in. So sometimes it's just the job description itself and it's kind of funny, you see some job descriptions where they copy and paste from another company and don't forget, they don't remember to take out the other company's name. <laughs> so the professional networking is important. So any people you meet here, make sure you're meeting people, connect. You know, even if you're going through college and stuff, some of the people you're going to school with or you're taking classes with, uh, even trainings, this may be someone who helps you get your next job. I've got a real good friend of mine that helped him get his first pen test job. We worked back in our AutoCAD days, back in 95, and about 2017 or so, he's wanted to get into cybersecurity, got his CISSP, and I helped him get his first pen test job. And this is someone I knew from a long time ago. And it's funny because uh, he was kind of my mentor in my AutoCAD days because he helped me write my first really good resume that I kept that format for many years. And then I was able to return the favor. So pay it forward and make sure to network with people. Uh, groups like this, I highly recommend the B-sides communities, people are more willing to help. The focus is on the community to help others. It, some of the commercial conferences be, can be good, but sometimes one of the things I don't like to see is when they eliminate students. If you're a student, you can't attend. Uh, if you're not in management, you can't attend. So that's a good sign to find the, the organizations that you're welcome at. So your ISSA groups are good. ISACA, uh, the ISC2 groups, DEF CON groups. But one of the things I recommend too is because I fall into I, you know, I run a DEF CON group myself and I attend like our DC 2 and 4 meetings and our Dallas Hackers Association meetings. Those are the ones that are most fun. Sometimes I kind of don't go to the ISS meeting, ISSA meetings, but it's good to, to go to the different types of meetings because the way I describe to people the Hacker Association meetings, the DEF CON meetings, the, the OWASP meetings, you learn there, but you go to the, OS, the ISSA and ISACA meetings to network with hiring managers and look for jobs. So make sure to kind of uh, diversify your, your your different groups you're associating with. Twitter has gotten, the online communities like Discord and Slack, Twitter or X as it's called now, are, are still good places. Most of the good security research I find is out there. It's still good places to, uh, to, to network with folks, find different conferences and stuff to go to. And then LinkedIn is, is a must have. I actually found out from my uh, friends that he's possibly in risk of losing his job and he doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. So that's something you always wanna have that's your online resume. That's how people are going to find you if you're not actively posting on job boards. So we can open it up to questions. And if you can't think of questions now, feel free to connect with me and, and check out my podcast because I've got a lot of people sharing some really cool stories about how they got started. Yes. Long time listener. Well, I enjoy your podcast. I get to listen to it very frequently. And, uh, how would you recommend, is there any magic bullet certi certification process that helps with lacking in the pedigree that comes from a military background in red teaming? So yeah, thanks for, thanks for being a listener and thanks for the question. So one of the things I would look at is uh, like the zero point security red team operator cert. That's a good one. So I would find, yeah, zero point security. It's their certified red team operator. That one nowadays, I'm hearing people are hiring managers for pen testing roles. They're telling people to get the OSCP or the CRTO, but the CRTO, you actually get to use Cobalt Strike. It's true red teaming because sometimes people get confused with what red teaming is, but uh, Rasta Mouse, he originally created content on Hack the Box, the offshore labs. It was kind of red teaming stuff. So you have to find the legit red team uh, content out there, but there's people creating more good content. But yeah, if you find some of the red team focused stuff you want to do red teaming but and even seeing like if you go to black Hat and some of these other conferences are even offering offering physical pen test training and stuff like that so yeah the certified certified red team operator 
is pretty decently priced, well-recognized certification. And so that one would be kind of one I would start with. Uh, Sector 7 creates actually some malware creation uh, courses out there. And I think the new the certified Red Team Operator 2, I think it's kind of a malware. So malware is like another progression in red teaming. You know, once you kind of get the fundamentals down, be able to write malware, be able to do evasion, because, you know, as a red team operator, you're wanting to be quiet when you try to break into environments. You're welcome. Thanks. Anyone else? Like I said, if anyone can't think of anything, uh, you can message me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer any questions. I do mentoring calls all the time. Uh, so if someone just wants to have a call, a Zoom call, you know, I can kind of take a look at your resume, your LinkedIn profile, and give you advice and answer any questions if, if you can't think of anything here. Our last speaker was about mentoring, and the question was how to find one. So this is a perfect yeah. example of people that are willing to well, help. And one of the things I wanted to say, because I wasn't really totally sure about his full talk, one of the things I'll say, too, if you're looking for mentors, don't pay for a mentor. There's a lot of people that do it for free. I've noticed a lot of people lately that they've got these accounts set up that you pay them for mentoring. You need to find someone that's really passionate about helping other people. They're going to do a better job, and you don't need to pay for it. Now, I can understand career coaching. If you're someone who wants to be a CISO at some point, you're making good money, and you can afford that. Career coaching is a good thing. But if you're trying to break into a certain area of the field, there's a lot of people. Find someone that's passionate wanting to help people, and you can get that for free. Well, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Good job. Someone had a question over here? Yeah, I was just going to ask, how much uh, credence do you give to uh, the Paul Jeremy certification map? I don't know if you've seen that online, where it, it has a series of certifications based on uh, specification. Um, is that something that you recommend people leverage? Are you familiar with it? And what was that again exactly? I'm not the, the Paul Jeremy certification roadmap for cybersecurity certs? Oh, yeah, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. I. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work put into that, but I, I think sometimes some of those things can kind of be misleading because they're listing, th listing things like CEH. If you're wanting to be a pen tester, you're wanting a certification that's universally accepted. You need something like the OSCP, PPNT, you know, stuff from Cyber Mentor, uh, Certified Red Team Operator, those type of certs. CompTIA, you can learn some good stuff from it. Pen the CEH, you can learn from it, but it's not really going to help you build the skills to be a pen tester. So the things they put out there is usually like that those roadmaps are so general they don't give you enough information and some of those people hadn't worked in some of those fields so when it comes to offensive security it's one of those areas that you really need to talk to someone that's experienced because some people are trying to tell you what they think pen testing is it's so much different that it's just really hard to, to describe so yeah if they those things can kind of be overwhelming and complicated when you see all those hundreds or thousands of certs in there in the roadmap of what to do and yeah good question Well, thank you.